uh, there's so many different types of transfer students. Are, you know, we were really talking a lot about the community college routes and bachelor's degree, but even that is a very confusing process, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, Josh Weiner, who was speaking earlier today, mentioned that eight, you know, of the students who are successful in getting bachelor's degrees, only 8% did a uh, 2 plus 2 pattern of spending two years at a community college and then two years at a four-year degree. And I just uh, thought you might be interested in seeing that 8% of students who, uh, in this uh, funky uh, star, star bursty chart that um, shows the 8% of students right here, but there's all sorts of other percentages of students that are taking a variety of different paths to get a bachelor's degree. And not necessarily that thing, but a lot of what we're going to be talking about is how to make these paths clearer to students. To um, And then when you look at the term, it's even uh, more divvied up when you're looking at term-by-term -term pathways to get a bachelor's degree. The, this is kind of the swirl, and uh, it's just pretty chaotic. So. Just a, a little piece of data, some, uh, data art to get started. Where's that? Okay. It's not yet. So this, I just developed it earlier this week, and I appreciate you all indulging me a little bit. Uh, I, I was surprised when I got to work in. Um, to show other people. <laughs> so all your foundation friends to fund this guy to get that out there so you can do okay. it. So this is uh, Josh Weiner. I'm John Fink. I work at the Community College Research Center. Um, we're going to be um, unpacking the transfer playbook. We didn't bring enough copies, but I saw some of you um, have some hard copies. So this is all the stuff we're talking about is on the web at the Aspen Institute and the Community College Research Center. We also have handouts, which I'm sorry I didn't bring enough, um, as well as um, rubrics that further describe the components of the playbook. Um, and this is all on the web on the CCRC and Aspen Institute. Uh, website. So let me just kind of like set the stage. Um, a lot of this is kind of, uh, Josh kind of covered a lot of the framing of this, but we're going to kind of get into the, the transfer playbook, um, to tell you a little bit about how we developed uh, the playbook, um, which is really kind of reflecting back the field's knowledge about transfer. Uh, and then we want to kind of uh, have some discussion, get some examples. Um, this is kind of ongoing work that we're going to be doing um, across the country and trying to get institutions to use this tool um, and, to, and to kind of, uh, you know, um, revamp it and improve upon it. So we're always interested in hearing feedback on that. So we'll be talking about a couple of publications from 2016. We're partnering with the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. They've been really great partners on this and the CCRC and Aspen Institute. Um, so we've gotten this new transfer data. Um, I was here at this conference last year talking about our tracking transfer publication, um, which really showed kind of um, for the kind of for the first time, like state by state, how state and institutions are doing on in terms of transferring out students and having transfer students complete their bachelor's degrees. And unfortunately, there's very inadequate and outcomes, but the hope is that there is a lot of variation in those outcomes. So individual institutions were doing pretty well, but there are also some who weren't doing well. So the kind of the hook there is like we what can we learn from the ones that are doing well, which is how the playbook came about. So in tracking transfer we put out uh, five new measures uh, to help the field understand how institutions and states perform uh, with transfers. So these are kind of like uh, broad measures of transfer success for community colleges, that's transfer out rate, uh, but also the rate at which transfer students get uh, an associate degree or certificate before they transfer. Uh, and we're also looking at the transfer out bachelor completion rate. This is kind of a new contribution of this report. Um, other research have looked at transfer rates, but we wanted to see of all your transfer students, how many of them got bachelor's degrees from any institution. And the clearinghouse data allowed us to look at that across the US. Uh, and then for four years, I think this is another contribution of the report, we're saying um, how do we hold four-year institutions accountable for their work with transfer students. So we created this transfer in bachelor completion rate, which was um, of all the community college students who transferred into a particular four-year, how many of those graduated and got a bachelor's degree. And then finally, kind of a combination of the two and the four-year was this community college cohort bachelor completion rate. That was just simply the number of students who started community college ended up with a bachelor's degree in six years, uh, which is really kind of a combination of that. So, uh, like Josh mentioned before, um, the outcomes were uh, not as great as they could be. 14% of students who went to community college got a bachelor's degree within six years. We found about only a third of students transferred 
Uh, we, as Josh mentioned, we tracked more of a limited cohort of students that were degree seeking um, and um, weren't participating in high school enrollment. They, you know, these were the sort of students that were most likely to intend to transfer into the bachelor's degree. Um, so this is just a scatter plot of these, all these are all individual community colleges, all these dots. And we have here on one axis the number of transfer students, and on the others the transfer out bachelor completion rate. And the point here is that there's a lot of variation um, in individual community college performance in how transfer students do. So I think that was a major finding in of itself. We saw that in the four-year colleges as well. There's some are seem to be doing uh, much better than others. Um, but when we look at the average um, performance of community colleges based on certain characteristics, like are they in the city or more of a rural area, do they serve more of an upper income or lower income student population, what we imagine might predict this variation doesn't. There's a pretty like, similar averages um, among these groups. But it seems to matter more where students transfer to, because we saw a lot more differences in the averages in terms of four-year institutions. <laughs> So students who transferred to public institutions did slightly better than privates. The private for-profits, as Josh mentioned before, had very low completion rate. Uh, it's no surprise that more selective institutions had higher completion rates, and uh, higher income serving institutions had higher completion rates. So it seems to matter more where students are transferring to instead of where they're transferring from. That was one of the findings. A lot of questions now. Um, anytime. Yeah. So, yeah, that was here, but even when we're selective, it's not especially impressive, right? Yeah. But that's very slow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a, 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 a class half empty. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, John, um, how many, but that's, that's to the top three barons classifications, right? Yes, yeah, so only 20% of the transfer students went to those very selected schools. But it's also the top three classifications, not what we think uh, of as. I got you. <laughs> well, there's most selected, and, and then another category that I think there's a top. I think. I think that's the top. So, yeah, the other thing to mention is that there's a huge like deviation in these averages. So like some institutions were doing much better than others. That these are just kind of the averages. But it's interesting to show that like the community college by types of community colleges, the averages weren't that different. But with the four years, they were more different. Uh, we also saw there's big state differences in averages. So these are all of our states listed up here, um, and you see these are the three community college rates that um, you know some states are doing much better than others in terms of these uh, different outcomes. Um, and I think I'll just, I'm just going to go over, show the, show the difference here. Um, this was true in uh, public four-year institutions and private nonprofit four-year institutions, uh, that there are these big differences. Um, and all of this is in the report if you kind of want to dig in further and see where your state is. Um, and I'll, I'll give a presentation tomorrow afternoon where I'll kind of dig into more of the sort of data and, and uh, illuminate some of that. Uh, sometimes I like to pick on states and show how they're doing. <laughs> but, um, same, same thing with the cohort, um, this overall rate of completion. So not only is there variation in terms of individual institutions performance, but there's also variations in terms of statewide performance. And this isn't necessarily surprising, but uh, it's really good to know, and I think it's it, kind of important to consider um, when thinking about how to improve transfer outcomes. The other major finding from the report was that there was consistent and troubling gaps between lower and higher income students um, uh, in terms of this rate and the others. And this shows kind of, you can see for some states that gap is pretty large, like 10 or more percentage points. In some states it's smaller. Unfortunately, we didn't have any uh, data really about a lot of student demographics in the data set. We had to derive this income measure using like census um, information about your, the neighborhood students lived in. Um, but we, like we didn't have race information, it would be really important given like the current work done on uh, race and transfer. It's telling me that has no high people. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe we uh, don't have data on Nevada because we suppress it because um, like when we work with clearinghouse data, we only report uh, if there's more than three institutions. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, another theory perhaps. <laughs> Our conclusion is just that it seems like transfer outcomes really depend on what the institutions are doing. Um, this may seem like really obvious, but I think it's uh, important to know, and from a policy perspective, it's important to make really clear um, from the making the case with the data. 
we're going to talk about the transfer playbook. And uh, since I've been talking about our work with the data, I just want to tell you about how we um, came to create the transfer playbook. Um, we first took this rich national data set that we were using for the first report, and um, we identified <coughs> highly effective transfer partnerships. And it's just kind of interesting um, to think about what's happening nationally with transfer. It's a very 30,000 foot perspective. But in, our, in the data set, which were all of these students who started at a community college in the fall of 2007, um, about 247,000 students transferred, meaning that they enrolled in a four-year college at some point, and they started in community college. Um, they're, they're transferring from 803 different community colleges um, to 1,800 different four-year colleges. And that kind of yielded 44,000 different unique pairs of two- and four-year institutions that students were transferring to and from. So, I mean, I mean, that's a huge number, but I even know, like, for colleges that have, you know, think of all the transfer partners that you have, um, and then, like, multiply that by how many colleges there are in the U.S. This transfer thing is a mess. It's a web. Um, but what's interesting is that when we started to select highly effective transfer partnerships and kind of limit our data set to pairs of, co of institutions that had more transfer students, like, the median number of transfer students in a pair was 30 transfer students. Once we kind of only picked college or pairs of institutions with more than 30, there's only only like um, I think like 1,200 unique combinations and like only uh, just like a smaller group of, of institutions. So that's what we did. This is um, kind of a, a small graphic that I don't necessarily want to take the time to run through, but we used a two-step procedure to identify um, pairs of institutions that were performing much better than you would expect based on their student and institutional characteristics. So we took into account what people would call the inputs or the institutional resources or the student demographics information that we had. And we, we looked for pairs of institutions that had uh, much higher um, completion rates for transfer students than we predicted in our models. So we took like this value added approach. And from that, we whittled it down to a list of 177 transfer partnerships that did much better than expected, but also had like a lot of transfer students um, in them, and we uh, basically screened the top like 30 pairs on the phone, and then went to the, t the top pairs that um, seemed to be doing things that were explaining their strong outcomes. And that's how we got to the transfer playbook. And here are the colleges we visited. Great, thanks, John. Any questions for John about the data? The piece of this, um, other than that circle thing. That I <laughs> Great. Well, we can ask uh, some later if you got them as well. So we went, as you can see, um, you know, we actually picked more than six pairs, um, and we actually contacted them um, and just asked them whether they were aware of why their outcomes might be strong um, and whether they were willing to have a visit from us. And so from among the 12 pairs that we interviewed, we chose six. And then, you know, it makes sense because we were looking not just for high performers, but we were also looking for those that had a sense, could explain something about what they were doing. Like, you know, we need to share practices with you all. They have no idea what they're doing. But, you know. So, um, so this is where we end up. And we also looked for some geographic diversity. Um, so these were the colleges that we ended up going to. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the four key areas are prioritizing, mapping, dedicated advising and partnership practices. So why don't we walk through each of those. So the three areas of prioritizing transfer, and by the way, it's, it's always a danger to put your materials out before you get started because somebody took the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I may turn around a little more than I can. <laughs> See, wall, every wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See? Okay. Um, so uh, first is communicating the importance of transfer. We often think of communications as a sort of a verbal thing, you know, the president standing at commencement and talking about the importance of transfer. That matters. Um, but there are also physical ways of doing it. Presidents, provosts, deans showing up on each other's campuses, um, speaking before each other's committees. And there are also um, artifacts. There are places where culture and priorities reside. So is it on the board agenda? You can look at those kinds of things, right? Um, is um, is it in any of the efforts when you're bringing faculty on at the four-year school, um, if they're going to be involved in any way in the transfer process? Are you actually asking questions in your, in your interview process? Are you 
prioritizing that in other ways. So thinking about communicating is not just a matter of words, it's also a matter of uh, places where culture tends to reside. So think through all of your processes where you've got people on your campus who are coming in that are engaged in transfer. Is there any training for them? What professional development is available? Um, so communicating the importance of transfer uh, to the mission is key. And it happens at the presidential level, but it also, where you see it really working, it's all the way through the institution. At Everett Community College, everybody's asking students when they say they want to transfer, where are you going to transfer and in what major? That's just standard practice. If you run into somebody, it's, faculty, it's not just advising. Right? It's the faculty talking about that. That's just the mantra. Bill Messner, Holyoke Community College. If you want to bring somebody who wants to talk about transfer, you, I don't think you can get a sentence out without talking about it um, when he's talking about student success. So it, it really penetrates the culture of the institution. And that's not very intentional. Um, and I think often we, 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 think, we think culture just kind of magically is there. And we hope it will exist because we tell people this matters. But it's a very intentional process of embedding it into a lot of systems. So did you get a sense that the sort of conversation we often have in California is, yeah, transfer is important, but we, of course, we're three because we have these nine other missions, whatever it might be. Did you get a sense that those other missions were less important, or they simply said, no, transfer is what we do here. Yeah, we do some of these other things. I guess what I'm trying to ask is they suppress the other yeah. issues or did they? I mean, I think, so, I don't think they, I think the effect was that they did. But I don't think they were intentionally saying these things don't matter. But I think, by definition, when, and there's only so much focus that an institution has. And so I would say definitely at Everett and um, at um, uh, Holyoke, um, you got the sense that they just decided this is a huge amount of what they did. And part of it was because they saw what students' desires were. They thought they were doing well. And then that sort of leads you to number two, which is they looked at the data. They said, oh my gosh. I mean, the urgency created out of looking at the data was such that they felt that they had to do something. And that took over as a priority. I think it, inherently when something becomes a priority, other things are deprioritized. Do you think, what, what do you think? I, I, we were at different colleges. We didn't both go to all of them. But. <coughs> Yeah, and I would add, because I think uh, census work, we've also done, been doing other sorts of field work um, kind of around these guided pathways uh, reforms, which are kind of similar to what we're talking about in the playbook in terms of systematic, like college-wide reforms, um, thinking about, you know, kind of the end in mind, like we were talking about before, what students are looking for. And I think that, you know, when, when this sort of initiatives and priorities can be packaged together, like under umbrella kind of initiatives, that can, that can you know, make sure that everyone is kind of pushing towards these things which are have a lot in common, which, you know, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say if, they're, if it's deprioritizing other things. Yeah, I, mean, I would just say that, that in my experience through the Aspen Prize, I've been 30 something top colleges now, and I think the hardest thing to blend is CTE and, and, and Janet. I and mean, those are places where I think it's really good colleges where I go on to both sides of the house and I feel like I'm in different places. I, I, I don't know how to say that. I think there are a whole bunch of reasons we can talk about why that's true. I think the incentive structures, the funding structures, there are a whole bunch of things that are simply different and will inherently always be separate, but bringing those together is hard. So to the extent that they're really strong transfer institutions, I think CTE is the place. That, that, that's a choice, in a sense, in terms of where the administration goes. Well, the second point is sharing data on outcomes. And, you know, our favorite story about this was that Colorado State University, in about uh, 2000, um, looked at the data and they, they realized they had 40% of their students were transfer students. And they started, um, the people who were sort of cared about this said, I don't think people know that. So they started an informal survey. People said 5%, 7%, 8%, nobody knew. And so they created a report that um, set forth what the myth was, the misconception on one hand, and the evidence on the other. So the misconception was transfer students represent a small proportion of the total undergraduate students' population at CSU. The report that went out to everybody and was communicated was 43% of all new CSU students were transfer students. Right? I mean, so it was about not just sort of a report that stood alongside others, but they realized that they had a moment. There was this moment in time where they had to have people understand this wasn't about prioritizing something that could be. It was about recognizing something that was and is. Um, 
Similarly, that the students weren't qualified for direct admission to CSU from high school. Um, it turns out that only 7% of transfer students had previously applied to CSU for freshman admission, and they were not. So the lore was that the transfer students, you know, from the from the conversations, that the transfer students were somehow, now they didn't get it the first time, they're not qualified. But no, it turned out that that was a tiny fraction of the students, and, and so on. So this report stood as a moment in time, and their relationship with Front Range took off from that moment, because the four-year college folks realized how important transfer students were for not just achieving student success, but frankly, for their paychecks, like for their revenue stream, right? Um, so data sharing, regular ways of sharing data, I talked a little bit about thinking about enrollment and then all the graduation student success, and then thinking about how does transfer stack up, in what context is that presented? Is it presented alongside those other data points? And then finally is resources, and we'll sort of get to that later, but this is a real, this really is an important leadership moment which is when leaders put money into dedicated transfer advising, even though it's just one or two and there haven't been any before, that's a really important signal. And so in whatever divisions you are, if you can think about not just the um, actual need, which we'll get to in a moment, there are resources that you need for transfer advising, but the symbolism of resources matters a huge amount. Um, so we saw that, and, and some of that can be in grant activity, celebrating grants that come in for transfer to work with two and four year institutions across those lines. We saw that a fair amount through some STEM programs and others. It's signaled, and, and the president's elevated that. Look at this terrific work um, and getting national recognition for it. So strategy two is really about creating clear program maps. Again, I mentioned major specific program maps. So one of the things that we heard, and we met with students as well as with the four-year partners and two-year partners, we heard it time and time again. And it wasn't just in science. So science is an obvious place where there are regimented sequences, and if you haven't followed them adequately, you're going to be in real trouble. So um, at, at, at a pair of the colleges, um, you know, community colleges may offer science for, liberal, for, for, for humanities majors and science for STEM majors. But the signaling to students about which you ought to take is often not very clear. So you have students who take chemistry with an algebra base instead of chemistry with a pre-calc or calc base. And then they try to transfer that to the four-year school and go good, got to retake chemistry. And frankly, they're making these decisions and their advisors are making these decisions if they had an advisor help them based on schedule. So it's really important that these program maps be major specific and name the course and the specific equivalent. It's not chemistry, it is the course that will transfer. Um, it, it's also true in fine arts, we also heard it in English. So Western Washington, they were very concerned that students, you know, it was a very literary, it was literary, it was about literary critique was the real focus of their English uh, major. And students were just not coming in with the adequate writing skills. So these maps don't have to, it can't just be about um, uh, the courses. They have to be really discussing what the rigor is that's expected at the four-year school and the alignment of that. And that's not to say that it always means that the community college course was not rigorous, right? Sometimes it's just not a lot. But hey folks, sometimes it really isn't rigorous. And this is one of the things we found, was that even at these institutions where we went, people were still pissed off at each other. They were. Uh, they did this to us. But they had vehicles through which they could express that. And they understood that sometimes the problem is of our own at the two-year side. And the four-year folks said, yes, sometimes the problem is of our own. <coughs> and so um, we need to really think about rigorous instruction and then a reliable uh, process to update and improve maps. That communication to it, I talked about that a little bit earlier. The final piece of this is devising, devising unconventional pathways. Um, as John just showed, only 8% is 3 plus 2. Sometimes in the data you may discover that 3 plus 1 is possible, or 1 plus 3. Actually, um, Arizona State and Maricopa, the person from Maricopa won an award earlier in the year. Anybody from Maricopa? Um, right, so, so Maricopa, I understand that Maricopa and ASU looked at their, at what was happening, and it turns out that students who finished one year in engineering at Maricopa did very well if they transferred after one year. But two plus two wasn't working so well. 
uh, either they weren't admitted to the program or they weren't prepared, they were taking extra courses, excess credits. And so they got together and said, how do we solve this problem? Let's create a one plus three, but at the end of the second year, let's do it, this is a great example of reverse transfer. Let's do a reverse transfer process so that Maricopa gets credit, right? So you do one year at Maricopa, a second year at ASU, stop for a moment, Maricopa awards you an associate's degree. So Maricopa now has credit for the work that they did for one year, you're getting two years of credit, even better, but the point is, Let's recognize that formally with a degree, and then let's have the last two years continue at ASU. Um, I think that the strength of that partnership really is revealed by the fact that, number one, ASU cared enough about the performance funding or the implications uh, for Maricopa of having graduates matters, and Maricopa understanding that, they, that it was best for students for them to give up that one year of revenue um, in order to enable them to succeed. So thinking about unconventional factors in that case, did they align the curriculum and the requirements then, such that there were no extraneous requirements at Maricopa? And they were able to literally just continue on that linear pathway and, and get the reverse transfer? They have strong maps there. They weren't one of the pairs here, but I, I understand from colleagues who have been there that they have strong maps there, so that it is very well aligned. Okay. Um, so we're doing the same thing with some of our community colleges. And where are you trying to say? West Virginia University. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're at the bottom of a lot of your uh, charts earlier <laughs> regarding <laughs> so, the point of is because a lot of our community colleges are trade based. So the problem that we're running into while we're doing these one plus two is because they don't offer a lot of courses necessary for engineering, although they the thing, well we have engineering technology and it, you know that line comes up. So we are starting them off on how one can you know, what you want and so on because it goes down the first year which was well because they actually don't offer those other disciplines. We never have students that are prepared well enough for those for that those courses. So this is a really important point. So uh, we do all of this analysis on transfer and workforce as part of the asset program. When we have technical colleges, we look at their transfer rates and we we say to them and in, you know when we go to meet with them, how many students transfer? So Lake Area Tech has been one of the top five colleges in our process every year since we started this thing. 70% graduation rates, 90 plus percent job placement rates. They, you know, students earn 40% more than the average worker in the region. I mean, it's really remarkable, right? But their transfer rates, you know, if we said, what's your transfer rate? We don't transfer students. We have 30 technical programs. Students have transfer. 22% of them do when we got the clearing house data. What? What are you doing about gen ed outcomes? I don't know. What, gen ed, what are you talking about? We embed them all in the programs of study. We, they just need to get job, right? So, They've done a remarkable work to ramp up the gen ed outcomes. We were talking about that earlier, the critical thinking that is required beyond the particular job to really think about what's needed and transfer and expect it. And it's gotten to the point now where they're meeting with the South Dakota universities to say, let's figure out equivalencies. Because we can show you now, they've worked to try to deepen the critical thinking. We can show you that this should transfer even though it's a, a, a two-year program in airplane mechanic, for airplane mechanics. You can, these students will do really well in their engineering programs. Uh, they're really ready, they understand how mechanics work in ways, frankly, that your first two years may not provide. I can say that, but it's have to go to state. So um, this is a really important point about that. In North Carolina, they're facing some of the same issue, although they have higher mobility rates than West Virginia does. So it's an interesting question of why. They started as technical schools. Yeah, I would also just add that, that you know we, we ran, encountered a number of examples of these unconventional pathways and they're listed in the playbook, but I think one another theme that stood out was that the unconventional pathways, these were worked out because groups of faculty or deans from the different institutions basically sat down and talked about what is the ideal pathway and they did some outside the box thinking, especially for some of these concerns like, well, we don't offer that course here or it's actually really far for, you know, some Area, so can we offer that program here on campus? So, but that you know, and that's easier said than done to get the, especially the four-year faculty to you know, which have a, a variety of other incentives and, and demands on their time, which kind of goes back to the making transfer a priority. And I think you'll see these these three broad strategies really do work together. There's like a gestalt effect of having them all, and definitely the last one, the advising piece, is super critical because what's the point of having maps if nobody knows about them? So, and I love those slides of outline of box safety for some of our agreements in the fine arts. They're actually sending graduate students from our campus to the community college that we have the faculty to teach some of the courses that they don't have as well. So, they get some of the, some of the opportunities and their teaching faculty things along those lines also. So, 
yeah. I'll fill those gaps that it's going to be fine with our programs. That's really important because a lot of community colleges don't have a volume of folks who are majoring in that subject, right? You still want to have fine arts as part of a well-rounded curriculum, but they may not have the 200 level courses in studio art. And again, if you arrive in junior year and, and you haven't done those things, you are not finishing these two years. The notion that you can do all your studio art courses in the last two years of college is possible. You just can't. And so the question is, how do you create the partnerships through faculty or labs if you have pro that you're proximate to one another um, so that the labs can be offered? You may not have that. But, but faculty as a resource, upper division faculty, especially in those things where you really have to start in your sophomore year, um, is, is a shortage in small, some smaller community. I mean, the points of alignment as well. We've done that 21 pathways were going out to the University of California, except one of the film studies. Well, UCLA, they make movies, and at Santa Cruz, they study movies. And so, and so the courses, if you're going to build a pathway, how do you build a pathway when the end game is different? And that's a great thing because the diversity of higher ed is a wonderful thing that. Exactly. Exactly. So, That's what I usually say. Yeah, so we, so we saw this in, in, in Washington was a good example. So they have these like uh, direct transfer agreements, which are like these statewide um, transfer agreements. And what uh, Western Washington was doing, uh, or with every, actually every community college, what they were doing is they were taking these statewide like templates and then customizing them for their major uh, destinations. And it's, it was really as simple as like including a couple notes uh, below the business DTA saying like, if you're going to Gonzaga, think, you know, take this course for this requirement because they have this pre-major requirement. Uh, so I think that, you know, basically like the state, I think it's, you know, we didn't really do an exhaustive study of state policy, but generally what we heard was like state policy could help this process, but the really good articulation was happening more local and more customized uh, between uh, departments. So, so just say, just a question. all I want to say is I'm at a community college in Ohio, Cuyahoga Community College, and, and the, the state of Ohio has done a lot of things for transfer initiatives. There's a lot of great things going on. Um, but the one thing I do when I'm working with four-year schools is to, to get the faculty together. And we are, we are changing at, at the community college some of our coursework to better align with what they're teaching so those they're more seamless kind of transfers. So if you can get your faculty to buy into that and them to work together as far as making sure you're covering all the, the coursework and all the learning outcomes that they're doing, or having the four-year school see if they could if we could get enough of a cohort of students to take the course online, for instance, and have it taught online. So some of those things have been pretty successful for us so far. So there's a, a field of study called collective impact, which um, some of you are probably familiar with, but it, it suggests that whole communities and multiple organizations can come together around a particular purpose if they follow a kind of a, a playbook. And uh, uh, we actually think, as we're working with leaders, that that same playbook works for any partnership. So what I would say is what you've developed is some continuations, some, some, some forms for continuous communication, which is really strong. You've also created mutually reinforcing activities, right? You're thinking about what the other place needs so that you're aligned. I think thinking about common goals, very specifically what they are, and common measures to see whether you're getting there, is a place where sometimes these partnerships don't check as to whether they're making progress. I think we get together with faculty and we say, great, we've got alignment. And then we go back to our institutions, and for a whole host of reasons, that may not happen or what we thought was needed isn't precisely what's needed. So iterating that more quickly and having common measures about in program, our students are more credits transferring from the two to the four year school. Um, do faculty believe students are better prepared or the grade point averages of those students? We take good? that in. We have right. to take that information in with us. Right, right, but really trying to monitor that relative to the native students by program to see whether this alignment, what kind of impact it's having. So that's terrific. That's great, great practice. Um, so these are just some questions that um, in programs of study you might want to think about and, um, uh, as you're convening folks and you've got these in the playbook as well. Um, the, the real point of all this is what what is what is equivalent enough? Without it, it can't be identical, right? I mean community colleges, they end at the end of Sophomore year, they're not going to have everything that the four-year school does. What is equivalent enough that we have confidence that students are going to be prepared? Um, I think that's really the principle. Of that. 
Um, so there's some examples here. Um, this is Pierce College. When you get on their uh, website where you can see that they're asking about career pathway roadmaps and transfers embedded in. This was sort of starting with the end in mind. But there are a few uh, colleges around the country, community colleges we're more familiar with, that have done this work to um, really make clear what the pathways are, the professional and technical roadmaps. Um, and they will include um, the transfer roadmaps. So when you click down um, on each of these, you'll find transfer roadmaps there. So just play around a little bit with the Pierce website. It's an interesting one. They very recently developed as part of their pathway work and it's designed to include transfer embedded in a bigger set of goals for students. As I was speaking about um, So um, it'll, it'll talk a little bit about uh, certificates. They have job outlook and wages that are included um, in, the, in, the, um, in the, the website. So you can see how this is trying to connect. It's not saying, how do I transfer? It's saying, what do I want to do? And how's transfer part of that? How's the two-year experience, four-year experience part of that? What are my options? And helping people explore it, but making sure that they can connect that to transfer. And um, I know this is, you know, with all these boxes, it looks, um, it, it's hard to read up here. But if you, if you play around with it, you can see a little bit more um, on there. Um, on the website. And this is through the four-year institution, or? This is Pierce, which is a two-year college. I'm sorry, I should have. This is a two-year college website. Because that's the point of entry, right? I mean, students need to start planning right from the beginning, thinking about careers, um, and then trying to map forward. If they start with the end in mind, what do I want to do? Number one, they're going to feel more connected. And number two, if we can provide the information, now we've got, we've got to have a path to that career. Not to a degree, to a career. And if that's going to have to take them through a four-year program, we need to tell them that right away. Because remember, they're going to have to plan financial aid, they're going to have to plan their lives, they should have a sense of what that looks like. So this is the community college website. So strategy three is really providing tailored uh, advising. And, and, and please raise your hand if you have thoughts or comments. This is terrific. Right? Uh, please keep doing that. Yeah? If the previous slide uh, from Pierce College, is that um, that their own, they built that, or that, do we have something to implement Career Coach? Yeah. Which is a similar? Yeah, Career Coach, which is a career builder product, EMSI yeah. product, is, is uh, something we've seen a lot of colleges using as part of a system to help students choose a program of study, <coughs> uh, choose a career or a program of study at the community college, um, and it tends to be curated for your school, right? And, you know, you have an interest in not driving them to careers where you don't offer a program of study. Query if that's one of the top careers, whether you should, but I'll leave that to you. Um, but that, no, that, 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 that has been a very effective tool that I know Walla Walla is using a number of colleges that we've gone to look at um, as part of this right. kind of thing. So that's an exploration. I mean, the website doesn't stand, you know, it's not, we're, we're going to be doing a fair amount of work this year to try to figure out what really good onboarding systems look like that connect students to both pathways and um, credentials. So, so John is on the research in that as well. So, so that's a really important question. I think career coach is a tool. The website is a tool. Um, but advising, structured advising um, around that. And monitoring whether students have made choices. So at Everett, you have to make a choice. And gets this moment. Within, their goal is that within the first three quarters, right, there are quarter systems. Every student will have chosen not just a major, but a, a, a primary destination for transfer. Every transfer student in that first year. That's their goal, and they're monitoring that. How many did we have the first quarter? How many in the second quarter? It doesn't mean we force students into things, but it means that we use tools like that to help them actively explore. We're helping them curate. We're, we know it matters if we can get them connected to something. So we're giving them the resources of the advising and helping them understand the importance of selecting. We're not trying to, to select before they're ready. By the way, that's the Pierce College in the Washington State, right? That's correct. Gotcha. At Fort Stellicom, South Stone. Yeah. 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 And they've done some really terrific work on transfer, and also actually on teaching and learning. They're an interesting hell of a sense of terrific stuff. Sorry, just to clarify, the work you guys are doing is separate from CCAs, but this much more? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is, um, <coughs> so our goal is to produce something like this transfer playbook for workforce. Oh. 
but it's you know specific practices within it. So there is behind this a um, a tool that we can develop that's a self-assessment tool that gets you started in thinking about whether your institutional practices are aligned. And so we're looking for things like you know in your website or in the board agenda in order in terms of prioritizing. Can you find these things? So we're trying to find ways for you to think about your own practice. Not that it's going to cover everything. Um, John Gardner does work with uh, colleges over a year or two to really dive deeply at, in a customized way. Ours is more of a, how do I get started in thinking about our practices vis-a-vis -vis this playbook? We hope to do the same thing with employers for committing to um, at Aspen. Waiting to hear about grants. I'll tell you if you know. <laughs> There's a theme here. We're on soft money. You guys have tuition dollars. We're on soft money. Any other questions before I move on to the other So, you know, I think one of the interesting things that a lot of colleges told us is that um, they align their advising to the questions they most often get from students. Interesting idea, right? What questions does what do students want to know? One of the ones is, are they going to let me in? Right? How do you help students understand that? Will my credits transfer? Are they going to count towards my major? That's as they get closer. They got to select a college accordingly. How many years will it take me to complete my degree? How much is it going to cost? It's not just the degree going to cost. What's the degree? The bachelor's degree. Get them started in that first semester thinking about what their bachelor's degrees are going to cost. Do they have my major? Interestingly, is not a question that students ask as much as they should. <laughs> think about that. I mean, it is just heartbreaking when students get into a college, they haven't had an audit of their, cre of their credits. They come in, and we heard, we heard story upon story about this. And they come in and they say, Here are my credits, and they say, you're going to have to go back to sophomore year. You have to do an extra semester or a year. And they say, I can't. What else can I major? What? They decided. They have purpose. And they're faced with a terrible choice. All my grads can transfer if I do something that I don't want to as much as the thing that I want, but that's going to cost me more money and time, and I don't actually think I can afford it. And I tell you, this happens with some frequency. And so at the four-year level, you really have to ask yourself the question, not just are you offering transfer, but in what majors? When I was an ACE fellow, I worked with Northern Virginia Community College and William & Mary. And William & Mary has a selective major in business, as a lot of selective colleges do. And the big issue was, are we going to take slots away from the terrific students who have a 3.5 average at William & Mary and now want to go into the junior year in favor of a community college student who had a 3.8? Community college, right? I mean, this was like, this was the conversation, and I do think that that question, how you answer that question, will go a long way towards helping you understand how much you really, really own the success of your community college. Um, so, what jobs can I get with my degree? These are the questions that students have. So, what do we see in terms of practices? Um, helping students decide as early as possible in the way everything, not just. You know, and you can think about a meta major, a general area of study, and then whittling down, but a notion of what they want to study and where they want to transfer. Continuously monitoring student progress along that path. Santa Fe College, I talked about earlier, one of the prize winners, with, has created with the University of Florida an amazing system by which students register. So how do you register for classes at Santa Fe? Well, you get on the website, and it's a, kind of like Travelocity or Expedia. When can I take class is the very first question you ask. So you've already decided they're pushing you towards major, right? So you've got a sense of your major and that you want to go to the University of Florida, which is a big sense for this. When can I take class is the first question. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, morning, afternoon, evening. Check the 21 boxes. When can I take class? Then um, what's my major? And then I'm going next semester. And then it comes up with and how many credits am I aiming to take? And it comes up with schedules, 22 options of schedules. Only schedules, only courses that will fit in your major and that fit the time of day that you say go to class, right? And that are going to count towards your requirements in your sub-requirements. 
you're not seeing all the extraneous classes on a catalog that don't fit those categories. So it's really curating. And so once you decide, yeah, that schedule looks like the best of these 22. See what I'm saying? It's like a schedule of four <coughs> classes here, four here, four here. Each is in a box. That's the one I want. And if you're in good academic standing, you, you click on it and it's held for you. So you just go here. Right? But that's, think about that. I mean, you do that with, with getting flights now. We used to call travel agents. My God. And think about the waiting time and like, the inefficiency of what do you really want. You know, it's so much more efficient to get on. So um, monitoring student progress, you can, you, there are some automated ways to help monitor student progress. Early alert systems, the student is doing poorly in a course that is really important for transfer that's only offered once a year, right? Monitoring that, knowing, boy, this is really important. There's one course they should not drop. This is the one. Um, and then helping students access the financial resources needed to achieve their goals. Holding loans down was something we saw at a couple of colleges. Um, a lot of students take on loans in community college to help ends meet without understanding that it's going to cost more to go to a four-year school. And they accumulate a level of debt that keeps them from wanting to continue. So really, again, thinking about a four-year financial map, four-year degree financial map, it help you advise students and say, let's talk not just about getting you through the associate's degree. Let's talk about what it's going to take and what the appropriate use of loans and Pell Grants are. Somebody earlier today said intensity, right? Getting to go full time. If you go full time now, or if you can come closer, you can go from nine to twelve credits. You can hold on to your Pell Grant all the way through a bachelor's degree. But if you don't have that now, it's hard to Yeah, I'll just jump in, especially with the, the full time, part time. I'm kind of. Uh, I work with this guy, Davis Jenkins, who has this mantra that I think is based on what he's hearing is he's encouraging people to think about not full-time or part-time, but on-time and what that means for the student, um, you know, and you know, having like transparency with, okay, I know I can only take these many classes, but this is kind of, this. that's what that means in terms of my on-time uh, graduation plan. So, so I, can, I can jump here on the, on the second part. Um, so I, my background was before I was working at CCRC, I worked at the um, University of Maryland College Park as an advisor with incoming community college transfer students. And um, I worked in the student union, so I was doing a lot of like, uh, like student life sort of things. And I would go to the transfer orientations every Wednesday throughout the summer and give the get involved speech in the morning to all the incoming transfer students, um, which was fun. <coughs> we had a good time with it. I think that a lot of them, you know, they're commuters, they're not interested so much in that. I mean, they wanted to be a part of the university life, but it seemed like academics and the nature. And they were all basically <coughs> awaiting the advising appointment later that afternoon where they found out how many credits were accepted and did they get into the program or not. But anyway, so I made the, made the pitch. Um, and then what, we, what I also was doing at the end of the day was we had an ice cream social for those students which um, was really fun and awesome and a great like networking opportunity. They got to talk with peer mentors, but it really ended up feeling like uh, just softening the blow from the advising appointment that they were just pre at previously. Like a lot of, oh my gosh, like keep my feelings, like and, like 12 credits or down the drain. That was a whole semester at this community college. Uh, so I, I don't really know what the point of that is, but um, just to share, I'm sure a lot of you have similar stories. It's really hard um, to do, especially when you have students showing up and they have all these credits and who know, maybe they only learned about the articulation agreements that when they were in their sophomore year at the community college and they wish they would have done it sooner. So for your colleges and the folks who work on the front lines in student services um, are really encountering like students coming from all different places and it's really challenging. Um, so I think these are some things we noticed from the four-year colleges that we visited. First, that there were full time <coughs> doing this work. You know, it wasn't. There were actually adequate resources committed um, for transfer students. And uh, another great. Uh, this is maybe a hopeful story. So last year, I was here presenting on the um, tracking transfer um, publication. I don't know if anyone has it. You can raise it up and show it. But someone took a hard copy uh, back. Um, so someone that I used to work with at the University of Maryland, College Park, took the hard copy back. She was working in the pre-advising office, which is part of their letters and sciences. They kind of handle all the students that come in, were admitted to the university, but not to a college. Like, how many know that story? And so they're kind of like uh, taking filler classes while they get admitted to the program. So they took that back and was able to basically
essentially make the case uh, to the dean to hire four more pre-transfer advisors that work specifically on the main feeder campuses, it's like Montgomery Community College and Prince George Community College, to do more pre-advising. And it, this isn't, you know, I, I think a lot of those similar positions exist out there, and it's like part of reaching down into the community colleges and working across institutions. Uh, but I always felt like when I was um, working in student affairs with transfer students, like I knew that work, partnering with the community college was like really important, but it always was the last thing on my to-do list in terms of like the priorities that I needed to do. Um, so I, you know, I think that's just kind of a, an example of kind of starting to get more resources for transfer students, especially that are dedicated structures for doing this sort of outreach. Um, another thing I'll I'll share is that you know it's kind of connected to encouraging students to, to, to pick a major. Um, but I think that in terms of like fairness and replicating elements that are similar to native students, um, there, there was a variety of like, you know, programs and services beyond advising to, that we were doing um, and that we saw at, at colleges to help students get integrated onto campus and get feel connected and a part of the university life. But one that I particularly want to um, talk about is what we saw it at UMass Amherst, who was really thinking about the financial aid allocation for students. And you know they have this bucket of money for um, to attract students um, and to give like institutional aid to students. And I think that transfer students kind of get systematically cut out from that because of the way our system is set up to, you know, um, institutions are striving up in the rankings, so they're throwing money at high school graduates to get them to come. Um, so we all know that game, right? So. Um, they recognized that this was like systematically disadvantaging transfer students, and another way that it was happening was just that transfer students were going to orientation last, so they were kind of getting to the pot last, even when they did start saving some of it for transfer for um, uh, non transfer students. So they really were addressing this uh, some of these systematic um, kind of issues, especially with financial aid. And I think that's right. If you're you know if you're in an institution. Um, I, I know that there's examples of various types of scholarships uh, that can exist, but also just you know asking the question. Um, I think it kind of depends on what your sphere of influence is, but you know what's going on with the financial aid allocation. And we had this really kind of uh, this quote from a student that was basically saying, "When I applied to the university out of high school, I got like twenty-five thousand dollars in aid, um, and then I applied a year later after going to a community college." And I didn't get anything. Like I'm the same student. Where's the money? Where'd it go? And I, you know, I think that a lot of students are experiencing that. Um, I think we kind of just want to pause there, yeah, yeah. get some discussion going. These are we went to six pairs of institutions across the country, um, and these are kind of the, some of the themes that we saw. But we really want to hear from you all, kind of what you think about that. Like, what sort of things are we missing? How does it? What are the implications for your work? What are the examples that you can share about your work? So we'd love to, you know, just have have the discussion here. Um, so I used to work at Santa Fe. I don't know if anyone else here yeah. Santa Fe. I want to sell your thunder. Um, and what I thought made the biggest impact on the transfer students was there we had an SF, or a US and SF center on campus. So it wasn't just admissions reps or, or whoever or other advisors coming from UF and setting up the table, but they had a place on campus and they were noted on our campus. And so not only could our students just drop in and see the UF advisor from a specific major in the center, but I knew them on a first name basis for the majors that I advised for at Santa Fe because they were on our campus yep. every couple weeks. And you know, if there were any updates, whatever, they would stop on office hey, son, you know, whatever. Um, so I think that having, they showed that they wanted transfer students. And they were able to fill that. And then in addition to that, in addition to the technology piece that you were talking about, um, I just felt like there, even on the website was, you know, um, that we had like uh, SF to UF stories, where they could see a picture of someone who was a transfer student at UF. And so it made them feel like they could do it, because this person is right here. And, and they absolutely did it. So I think this layered experience of, me as a transfer advisor, dedicated to that transfer, and the UF advisor coming, and there was a dedicated center for data engineering, which is basically a learning community. It was just the space that they had to study on our campus. It was like this layered experience of you can absolutely do this, you can come to the same thing. And think about the symbols, uh, you know, buildings built on campus with the other campuses' name on them, right? Transfer centers. We saw that in a couple of places that we went. Um, and I think the, the notion.
notion that success could get success is really, really important. It, we've seen this in a number of places that it snowballs. At Valencia College, they created with, with the University of Central Florida, Direct Connect. And, and it, it went to other schools as well. If you go to high schools, I'm told now, and you ask students what they're doing, they will say, I'm going to Direct Connect. It's become a verb. Because everybody knows what it means. It means I'm going to Valencia for two years, and by the way, all my credits will transfer if I go for two years. If I go for one year, they don't. Think about that as a mutually reinforcing message to students. And then I'm going to go guaranteed to UCF, not with a B plus average. You get a C. You graduate. You get an associate's. You're automatically in. So a college that takes a 1,200 SAT to get in as a freshman, I'm going to direct connect. Think about success with the success. The language has changed. I want to know how big of the populations were for these um, pairs matching and how many transfer students. Because I think sometimes, um, I'm from State University of New York and um, upstate New York. We have a lot of transfer students over uh, geographically pretty spread out. And there is some of that reaching down to community college, but it only reaches a, a small percentage of our students. Um, because from a geographic area, it's so spread out across the state. So I'm trying to think, like, it's really easy to focus your attention when you get a 1,000 students from one community college with really large ones. But when you get 30 or 20 from so many, it's kind of hard to really focus your resources. Yeah, the degree of difficulty goes up. I mean, there, we have a minimum threshold, but the degree of difficulty goes up. I would say when we look at the top three destinations for school, rarely do we find that same. Uh, or feeders, that's less than 50% of your student population transferring out from community colleges. Rarely is it led. In other words, the volume tends to be in these schools. And so, I mean, just one thing I would say is get the parent house data, see where they're coming from, find those where you've got volume, and figure out how to develop partnerships there. You can develop models that could work in other places. Um, and it may, all, it may also pay off to double down with those institutions where you have strong relationships and you can ensure strong, strongly prepared students. Now that's dicey because rural colleges will always, small rural colleges will always be disadvantaged if you don't allow that to happen. But um, it, the degree of difficulty goes up more than yeah. more what, One of the recommendations was to like focus on your major partners, but another side of that is to focus on your aspirational partners. So what who can you stand to benefit from like doubling down or trying to grow a relationship with maybe all of the theaters are like within an hour plus driving distance. I'm not sure where you are, but New York State is pretty big, uh, especially if you're in Adirondacks. But um, so <coughs> just something to think about. And then also think about by program. Maybe you know maybe your maybe your um, English program has been shrinking, and the, you can go to your English faculty and say, hey, we can start you know feeding students into this program from X community college.
recognize your piece of it first, and then you got a shot of other people recognizing theirs. Um, there's just there is a power relationship, and there's a sense of you know, there are all of these things that we hear, and you all know that, right? You're not preparing students. Your standards aren't high enough. You don't care about our students. You're being biased against them, and there's probably you know some truth in every um, stereotype that there is, but those are largely not true. Um, if we can start from a place where we're looking at the same information. Um, and so that can be done at an institutional level where presidents and pro provosts decide, hey, we're going to do this together with some folks, but it can also be done you know, if you don't have leadership that is on board yet. It can also be done at transfer champions who have some leadership role and can meet people um, and can get the data to start. So that, that's just my idea. Yeah. See, so, uh, so I don't want to be calling the legislature, but did you, I, mean, I know you've been, you've been uh, looking at mostly at, at interinstitutional sorts of relationships and what works there, and now that I'm back at the university, I think that's the best way to sort of build the relationship. But is the research thus far that you've come up with or identified any state level kinds of policies that you think hold some traction? Like, again, I don't want to be calling any of my legislators. Yeah, I mean, we should. Sure, I think that the AST, the Associates of Science and Transfer in Washington State, have been pretty effective. You know, they're general enough to be supplemented. They're, they're um, where the state basically says you've got to get together and agree. Um, I think, I do think that common force numbering, guarantee transfer arrangements, and I actually think once upon a time, California is actually 80% of the other division for the four year schools will be um, uh, teachers in the state. 60% of the student body will be, will be the upper division. Was a priority for community college. It sounds like a pretty good policy to me. It's sort of falling apart. I would say one thing is that Washington and California share you know, students do very well after transferring, but they have very low volume in this setting, or lower than you expect. And so there's one state issue that we've got to deal with, which is some states have enabled or, or seen community college involvement and grow and haven't invested in four years of tax or insisted that something be carved back in four years. So both of those states probably, the policy is, what are you going to do about the impact of four year gains? Right? And that is kind of very big California. Right. Yeah. So no, this is, this is a big deal. Um, so I think one of the nice things about the data runs that Davis and, and John did is that if you see that, copy, that your, your state is low on transfer out rates, that is a different conclusion than if you're on transfer out with associates rate, which is a different conclusion than if the issue is that you've got low graduation rates once they transfer. So I think that these measures, if you start to look at them, um, there's a system in the country I'm aware of where I've looked at four colleges in the system. Same system to a four year. In every case, more than 50% mobility rates and 30% graduation. High mobility, low graduation. That tells you something different. Um, and, and again, I think these, these data won't give you the answers, but um, I do think that state policy, assuming that Dr. Ford's not working in place and some guaranteed transfer system, um, I think, um, and, and, and getting people together to say, you've got to create some general maps that can be modified some, but insisting on some two to four year maps seems to help, but they don't, um, they don't work unless the two and four year colleges really work better than that. That would be my So I think we're at time, but we can stick around. Here's an extra credit assignment for anyone. Uh, so go to your website, pretend you're a student, especially, or if you're at a four year, go to your major community college website and pretend that you're an entering um, first year student thinking about transfer. Can you find it easily? What's it like for you to be a student? Uh, we've done this with a few other groups, and it can be really insightful to just try to take it from a student's perspective. And it's something you can do on your campuses. And even as a four year, say, you know, I'm at Western Washington. Imagine you're a student at Everett. And you know you want to go to Western Washington and business and decide that. And you figure out what courses to do. Yeah, like, figure out who to call. Yeah, I guess the question is can you figure out which courses to sign up for that first term or the second term? Right. Uh, so wherever you are in the process, but you can alter this exercise. You can imagine how you might do it on your campuses. It's a way to get the conversation started, to ask the question are we prioritizing transfer? Have we created maps? And do we have good advising systems? The answer is not fix the website. <laughs> fix the <laughs> Don't let anybody give you that as the answer. Thank you. Thank you.